Good morning, everyone, and uh, Happy New Year. It's my uh, great pleasure to introduce my good friend and colleague, Professor Brian Kernahan of Princeton University, as the inaugural speaker of the 2021 Summit Old Guard Speaker Series. Brian is a Canadian, so he does not like floored introductions. I must therefore be brief. In a nutshell, Brian is one of the most influential computer scientists of our time. Brian received a Bachelor of Applied Science degree in engineering physics from the University of Toronto and a PhD in electrical engineering from Princeton. He then worked in the Computing Sciences Research Center at Bell Labs, where he quickly became, became a Unix legend, and he is now a professor of computer science at Princeton. One measure of impact of a computer scientist is whether he has an algorithm named after him. Under this measure, Brian excels. He has his name on two widely used graph algorithms, the Kernahan-Lin algorithm for graph partitioning and the famous Lin-Kernahan algorithm for the traveling salesman problem. The initials K and R are recognized by every systems programmer in the world. K and R is the nickname of the book, The C Programming Language. The K stands for Kernahan and the R for the late Dennis Ritchie, the creator of the C programming language and the co-inventor of the Unix operating system. The C programming language has been the number one or number two systems programming language in the world for more than 40 years. And KNR was instrumental in its widespread adoption and success. Brian is the author or co-author of more than a dozen books in computer science. Millions of students around the world have learned how to program from his books. And every programmer knows that the first program they should write in any new programming language is Brian's signature Hello World program. Brian is also world famous for creating useful application oriented programming languages. Virtually every Unix programmer has at one time or another used at least one of Brian's programming languages such as AMPL, AUK or EQN. Brian has earned some of the most prestigious awards in science and engineering. He is a member of the National Academy of Engineering and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has received the Unix Lifetime Achievement Award and the President's Award for Distinguished Teaching at Princeton. What I admire most about Brian is that he has a perfectly balanced brain. He can represent complex left brain concepts in such a clear fashion that they can be understood by the most artistic right brain people. So here, without further ado, is Professor Brian Kernahan, who will tell us what every well-informed person should know about computers. Brian. Uh, thanks, Al. Um, and thank you very much for that excessively kind uh, introduction. Uh, a little bit of background. Um, Al and I were undergraduates at the uh, University of Toronto many years ago. He was a year ahead of me at the time. Um, we were graduate students at Princeton many years ago. He was a year ahead of me at the time. Um, we went to Bell Labs. He went a year ahead of me. And at one point I reported to him as well. He was my boss. So I've spent an entire career basically being kind of one step behind Al. But I guess if you got to follow somebody, he's a great guy to follow. So I'm perfectly <laughs> happy with that. Um, let me see if I can get some slides up here for you folks um, and see how it goes. Oops, I seem to have lost the share screen guy. And we will do that. We will do that. And I'm going to guess that it is sharing screen. Somebody complain if not. Yes, you're good. You're good. OK, great. And I should also thank uh, Paul Tukey and the other folks on the Zoom team for making all of this stuff work smoothly. Let's hope it continues that way. Um, and one of the nice things about um, Zoom and having lots of people here is I can see all kinds of old friends, colleagues at Bell Labs and so on. So it's a great pleasure uh, to see you here. It would be nicer to be in person. The last time, in fact, the only other time that I spoke at the Summit Old Guard was in the summer of 1999. Uh, where I was invited, or perhaps more accurately, arm twisted by my neighbor at the time, Ed Boxall, who unfortunately died a few years ago. So anyway, with that out of the way, um, 
let me tell you a bit about uh, where I'm coming from here. Since I went to Princeton in roughly 1999 or 2000, I've been teaching a course pretty much every fall called Computers in Our World. Um, and the course is, well, it's, it's, a, it's a terrible title, but I had to invent it in zero time one day. Um, but the, the premise of the course is that computing and communications and all of the things that they make possible are just pervasive in the world around us. So think about your laptop, uh, think about your phones, think about all the gadgets that you have in your life. And then all the other things that are enabled by computers as well, including cars and medical devices and whatnot. So all of these things are changing our world. They're changing it very, very rapidly. And it seems to me that an educated person ought to sort of at least know something about this technology, which is so important in the world. And so the course that I've been teaching is basically an attempt to cover this kind of material for a very non-technical audience. The average person in the class is an English major or history major, perhaps philosophy, something like that, but a very non-technical group of people. So they're not likely to be creating this kind of technology in the future, but it's highly likely that they will be in positions of authority, responsibility, influence. And so it would be really nice if they understood some of this stuff well, so that they can perhaps do a better job than the people who are running the country at the moment. So the goal of a course is to convey just the basic ideas of computing and communications to this non-technical audience. Um, and perhaps a larger goal is to convey a sort of intelligent skepticism about technology, that technology is very much a two-edged sword. Mostly it's good for us, but there are also plenty of things which are not so good. And so what we like to do is get people to understand enough of it that they can see the good and compensate for the bad. So what I'm gonna do for you right now is let's call it the 45 minute version of the course. No exam at the end, you can relax. Um, and in fact, I suspect many of you already know this stuff already. Um, and so you can doze off just as if you were in a real class um, and I'll wake you up when we're done. Okay. So with that, let's see if I can push a button here. And I'll get to the right thing. Despite what Al said about me using Zoom uh, in classes. Mm. Anyway, so what I'm going to talk about is fundamentally three big ideas, if you like, hardware, software, and communications. And so that's the sort of the organizing principle of the course, the organizing principle of uh, today's talk, okay? So what's hardware? Hardware is the tangible stuff. You know, it's computers, it's laptops, it's all the gadgetry that we have. And the critical observation there is that we're talking about digital computers, that are, they're computers that pr process information that is fundamentally just numbers. And the numbers can represent all kinds of different things, but fundamentally it's just numeric processing of some sort. And the nice thing about digital information is it's really easy to store it. It's really easy to manipulate it in all kinds of ways. You can make copies of it for free and you can send it to anyone else essentially for free as well. So the computer itself, as we'll see, is a general purpose machine. It doesn't have much of a repertoire of things it can do, very simple instructions, not a heck of a lot more than an old fashioned pocket calculator, but it can do its stuff really, really quickly, billions of operations in a second. And the other thing is it can control its own operation so that it can decide what to do next on the basis of what it has already done, of values it's already computed. The other thing is that these digital devices have been getting smaller and cheaper and faster and more powerful for a very long time. And that pervasiveness, as we'll see again, is the reason that computers are everywhere, both the visible things like computers that in our hands and our, the phones in our pockets, but also all kinds of things that are hidden below the surface. And if you think, uh, many of you are of the age, <laughs> like me, uh, where you can remember things like cameras that use film, those are gone, right? You can remember long playing records, those are gone pretty much, unless you're an audiophile. VCR tapes, remember those? Um, cassette tapes, all of those things have, were very complicated analog mechanical systems that have been replaced by digital devices that are fundamentally just computers. So the, the hardware, people have been interested in using mechanical devices to do kinds of computation for a very long time. But I think arguably the first 
most significant, at least for our purpose, example of this um, is this guy, Charles Babbage, who was born in 1791. Um, very distinguished English scientist, uh, very interested in things like astronomy and navigation. And he spent a lot of his life trying to develop methods that he, he was prim primarily interested in computing tables of logarithms, really exciting stuff. Tables of logarithms that made it possible to do computations for navigation much more easily. And it turns out that that's very frustrating. Most people are not very good at doing arithmetic and especially if you have to farm it out to people to do the arithmetic for you. And so the tables were difficult to create, they had errors and so on. And at some point he said this absolutely wonderful thing. He said, I wish to God these calculations had been executed by steam. Well, that's an interesting image, computation by steam. But if you think about the timing there, 1821 is sort of 60 years after the invention of the steam engine and well before electricity or gasoline engines or any other forms of motive power. So, but this is basically, I wanna mechanize computation. So Babbage worked on this for a long time in his lifetime, design machines, sound designs, but never got them to be built because they were a little complicated and he alienated his financial backers. Um, Babbage left a number of things behind. This is one thing. I visited the Science Museum in Kensington in London a few years ago. And there is an exhibit of Charles Babbage and part of the exhibit is half of his brain. So Babbage was presumably a two core processor um, and there's one of the processors just in case you've ever wondered what cores mean in a biological sense. Anyway, um, what are some fundamental ideas in computing? Babbage was purely mechanical in what he was doing. That was one of the reasons why it was difficult. But later on, sort of a hundred-ish years later, people started to do more uh, significant things basically on electronic computing and theory. So there's two people here that are really important in communication. The first is John von Neumann, who was a polymath born in Hungary, came to the United States uh, in the early 1930s to escape Nazism. Um, and settled at the Institute for Advanced Studies just across the road from Princeton University. Von Neumann maybe gets a bit too much credit for it, but the idea of the von Neumann architecture for a computer is that the computer processes data that is stored in a memory, but the instructions that tell the computer what to do with that data are in the same memory. And that means that you can change what the computer does by putting different instructions in the memory. And then that's the thing that makes a computer a general purpose device. Can't tell what, whether something is instruction or data except by trying it out. And the logical structure that von Neumann set forth in the late or mid 1940s has been pretty much unchanged since, although the physical structure, the manifestation of computing very much changed over the years. The other person perhaps less, slightly less well known, um, but equally fundamental in computing is Alan Turing. Alan Turing was a mathematician who came to Princeton, in fact, in 1936 to get his PhD there. Um, and he was a mathematician, very interested in logic, and he showed that a fairly simple model of how a computer could work was in fact universal, that it was equivalent to any other computer you could build. And so you could use this machine, which is called today a Turing machine, to simulate any other computer. And that way show that all computers, all digital computers have exactly the same computational power if you ignore how long it's gonna take, how much memory you might need, things like that. So these are very, very fundamental uh, people in the history of computing. And I have a picture here, which is actually for Al. This is, where, <laughs> this is where Alan Turing lived when he was on the Princeton campus for two years. I should also observe uh, that it only took him two years to get his PhD, whereas Al took four and I took five and I, who knows, but you know, it's clearly going downhill. But anyway, uh, Turing lived there in the graduate college and that must be very close to where Al lived uh, when he was living in the grad college in Princeton. Um, this is entryway 18 in case you need it. Okay, so what we have is these two fundamental people, um, and the observation is that hardware keeps getting better in terms of what it can compute, not logically, but practically. So it stays the same in terms of its theoretical capabilities, but it just keeps getting better. So the picture in the upper left corner there is a model of one of 
Babbage's computing engines from the 1830s built as a modern thing in a roughly 2000. And as you can see, it's a big crank there. They didn't even have steam for that. Somebody had to turn the handle to make it go. Uh, the picture in the upper right is Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie working on Unix, which Al mentioned. We'll come back to that in a moment. The lower left is obviously the IBM PC, which at this point is 40 years old, uh, but revolutionized computing by making it available to everybody, not just people who had lots of money. And then of course, modern phones. Phones are computers. There's no distinction except that phones are better at talking to telephone systems. <laughs> okay, so that's the essence. One other thing, in 1947 at Bell Labs, and I noticed a number of old friends from Bell Labs in the group, um, 1947, three people at Bell Labs invented the transistor and 10 or 11, 12 years later, the integrated circuit was invented, not at Bell Labs. Um, and in 1965, this guy, Gordon Moore, who was one of the founders of Intel and the CEO for many years, made an observation, just an empirical observation that said that if you looked at the number of transistors that you could fit on an integrated circuit of a particular size, it seemed to be doubling every, call it 18 months or something like that. And that was in 1965 and the data started in about 1960. So you can see this exponential curve going up Exponentials grow very quickly. And so if you something doubles 10 times, that is two to the 10th, 1024, which is about a thousand, okay? So suppose that one doubling takes 18 months, then 10 doublings takes 15 years. And so that's a factor of thousand in 15 years. We carry it on for another 15 years and it's a factor of a million. And another 15 years is a billion. And another 15 years is a trillion. And we're in that billion to trillion range at this point. And because of that, things that we build, digital things, fundamentally with transistors, integrated circuits, keep getting smaller and cheaper and faster at this exponential rate. And that's the reason why they are so pervasive. And that's the reason why we can have a conversation like this. Okay, so that's hardware. I'm not a hardware person. Um, yeah. <laughs> we'll never be a hardware person. I'm more a software person. So let's talk about software because this is obviously much more important. Um, software is how you tell a computer what to do. Okay, so as I said, computer is a general purpose device. It does these very simple instructions, you know, add, subtract, put stuff in memory, take it out again. Um, it does it very, very, very fast, but it doesn't do anything until we tell it what to do. And we usually have to spell that out in painful detail to get every single aspect of it correct. So software is just the instructions that tell a computer how to do something. And as I said, if you have the von Neumann model of a computer with the instructions and the data in the same memory, then if you put different instructions into the memory, that's a different program, the computer does a different job. And that's the reason why my computer can be sitting here running Zoom so that we can talk, but it could also be playing a game in the background and it's probably listening for mail to arrive and all these other things going on simultaneously. Just different instructions in the memory. So programming is simply the act of writing out sequences of instructions to accomplish some task. And a programming language, I'll mention programming languages, those are the tools that we use to express the computations. The basic the rules of syntax and semantics, grammar, meaning for what does it mean when you want to comp you have to spell out a computation in sufficient detail that a fast but dumb computer can do it for you. Okay, so that's really all that we have there. So when we have software, we've done the programming in some programming language, what do we do? Well, we're writing programs that will do things. Sometimes these are programs that do specific tasks. What we were originally called applications and are now called apps, okay, things that run on your laptop or on your phone to do something like a word processor or a spreadsheet or Zoom, which you probably have loaded on your computer at this point. So those are applications, just big programs. Um, the operating system that sits behind it is something like this. It's a program that controls the computing resources of a computer. So a computer is a very powerful, very sophisticated device. It doesn't do anything unless you tell it what to do. And if you're trying to get it to do a whole bunch of things at once, you need something that acts as a sort of traffic controller or resource allocator to 
run a bit of this program, run a bit of that program, and keep going around and around that way. And so the Unix operating system is, um, was developed, in fact, in 1969 at Bell Labs in Murray Hill by Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie. Ken is seated there, and Dennis is standing. Um, uh, Dennis is also responsible for the C programming language, which, as Al mentioned, is one of the most popular languages to this day. Uh, still probably number one or two in languages that are used. I put up C++ there as well, which is a language that derived from C, uh, roughly call it 10 years later by Bjarne Straustrup, also at Bell Labs in Murray Hill. And that's very widely used for lots of programs um, from many different sources. So what we're doing here is that we you can see an evolution as computers have gotten faster, smaller, cheaper, faster, better exponentially. What we do is we can then devote more of the resources of the computer to doing things that will help us. And of course we write bigger programs, but then we can use the computer to help us manage bigger programs. And so we have programming languages that make it possible to write bigger programs. And so there's an evolution of programming languages from relatively simple and straightforward ones of the let's say 1950s and 60s through to much more sophisticated ones today that track the same evolution that you see in hardware. As you get more power and more understanding, you can devote more resources of the computer to getting something done. So fundamental software ideas. Computers don't do anything without software. That's why programmers are so important. I tell myself that all the time. Um, and in fact, all of the systems that we use are controlled by software. There's dumb hardware, smart programs in some sense. That's the good news. The bad news is that programming is hard. It's really, really hard to write a program that works properly. And as programs get bigger, it remains hard gets harder. And that means that bugs are easy in some sense, they have to be. The problem is that everything has to be spelled out perfectly, completely, correctly. The computer is kind of like the ultimate sorcerer's apprentice. If you don't get the incantation right, it doesn't work. Um, and people are not very good at that kind of thing. And that means that all software has vulnerabilities, places where it doesn't work right, and potentially a place where a bad guy can get in and do something bad to you. And the corollary to that is that when you download an app onto your computer or onto your phone, what you're doing is letting someone else run their program on your computer or your phone. And therefore, whatever bad properties that program might have have come along with it. Bugs that make it not work right, vulnerabilities that let bad guys in, or things that are designed right in from the beginning uh, with evil intentions, okay? So that's software. <clears throat> how about communications? Well, this is where things get, how shall I say it, interesting. Perhaps interesting in the sense of may you live in interesting times. Because what we have here are computers talking to each other, sometimes to, for our benefit and sometimes not for our benefits at all. Uh, the manifestation of communications that most of us see most of the time now is the internet. The internet is a universal digital network. It takes all that information that the hardware processes in digital form and that the program manipulates in digital form and it sends it around the world in digital form. And it sends it around the world um, typically through many, many different sites and at every place where the information lands even temporarily, it can be inspected, it could be copied, could be modified in some way, could be slowed down, could be blocked entirely. Lots of bad things could potentially happen. So that's the internet. The World Wide Web, which is mostly what we think of when we think of using computers to communicate, um, is built on top of the internet. And it provides access to the things that we think of as you know, modern computing, like search on Google or mail with pick your favorite mail reader or news or social networking or all the other things that we use computers for in every day. And so what we have here is billions, literally billions of powerful general purpose computers, our laptops, our phones, lots of other gadgets, and they're all running vulnerable software and they're all connected to each other. Oh, and they're run by real people like you and me, and we screw up all the time. So as you can imagine, stuff doesn't always work right. Um, and so everything, and this is a fundamental idea, everything on the internet is potentially vulnerable. 
Spam is a, you know, just a nuisance uh, manifestation of that, but plenty of malware that shows up. Uh, phishing attacks where people try to entice you into giving up information about yourself or your employer or something like that. Uh, lots of spying, as we'll see. Ransomware, a comparatively new attack uh, where somebody encrypts your computer and you have to pay them money before they'll open it up for you. And lots and lots of other things. <clears throat> so that is the situation on uh, communications. What's going on under there? Can we get a better picture of it? So here's the internet from 50,000 feet, okay? There's this murky thing in the middle called the internet and there's stuff connected to it. So there's you and me and our phones and our computers stuck down there on the lower left corner sort of. And then somewhere, somewhere, we don't even know are all these uh, operations that provide services <clears throat> to us like Google and Facebook and Amazon and Wikipedia and of course Zoom uh, and many, many others. Um, so that's kind of what it looks like, but what's in that amorphous thing in the middle? Well, let's zoom in a little bit. So here's the internet from 10,000 feet. So we have a number of computers. Many of you will be sitting at home and you've got several different computers in your home and perhaps they're connected by a network. If you have a wireless router in your home, that is your local computer network. And that connects the computers in your home potentially to each other, but more likely connected to other computers in the internet with various kinds of, let's call them cables or connections, the heavier red lines there, and going through computers, specialized computers called routers or routers. So we could do a poll, but not right now on whether it is router or router. Um, and that connects one network to another network. And then if you think of the internet as simply hundreds of millions or perhaps even billions of local networks like that, with probably hundreds of thousands to millions of routers connecting information. And then information can go from one computer through a path through the network, probably 20 or 30 different routers to get to some service like Google or Amazon or to me at Princeton or something like that. So that's fundamentally the structure. We could keep going deeper into that. I'm not gonna go much deeper, but that's the basic idea. The internet is a amorphous, chaotic, not really disciplined ad hoc collection of millions of networks that connect billions of devices. And they're all over the world. Let me give you one more view of the internet, which is perhaps not as familiar. It's this one. This is the internet from underneath the water. How do signals get from, let's say, the United States to Europe or to Asia or something like that? They are uniformly carried by underwater fiber optic cables using fiber optic stuff that was invented, of course, at Bell Labs and other places um, you know, years ago. This shows only the underwater cables. This is from a great site called submarinecable.net or something like that. Um, doesn't show the connections that would be analogous across the land masses like the United States and various parts of, of Europe and so on. But you can see there's a lot of connection there. The interesting thing here is Suppose that you're in Europe and you want to send information to Asia. It looks like it mostly goes through the United States, doesn't it? And if you're in Asia and you want to send information to Europe or some part of South America or whatever, a lot of it looks like it goes through the United States. And so that says that's an opportunity for somebody to monitor what's going on. And in fact, the National Security Agency does monitor what's going on as information enters and leaves the United States like that. And who knows what happens um, while it's in the United States, okay? So fundamental ideas of the communication systems, the internet provides this universal connectivity, just sending digital information, you can send it anywhere. Those fiber optic cables go very, very fast. So you can send it essentially instantaneously from any place to any other place. And that means that we can easily communicate with people everywhere as we're doing here, but on a grander scale. You have relatives in the other, part of the other parts of the world or friends or whatever, that's how it goes. The flip side of course, is that <laughs> we're now visible to strangers the world over. And they may or may not have our best interests at heart. They may not just be nice, friendly people in other parts of the world. 
Okay. The other thing that you can see from that picture of, of the submarine cables and then also the cables going across land that aren't in the picture, that information passes through many sites as it goes from one place to another. We are talking with Zoom. My image and what I'm saying is going to some Zoom computer somewhere and then it's being farmed out and sent back to your computers. Where's that somewhere? I don't know, but Zoom's gotten into trouble because some of that information appeared to be going to China and back. And so was that expected? I don't know. But that does raise the question of who's in charge and what are the rules by which disputes get settled? Because what we've got is a technical thing, which is kind of independent of geography in a real sense. It doesn't matter where things are, but somebody gets to make rules and decide how to deal with things that are legal in one country and not legal in another country or countries that don't want their citizens to see something or want to see a particular view of something. All of those are difficult issues. So the World Wide Web is how most of us see the internet and communications in general. We don't see the underpinnings that much. We don't think of the fiber optic cables. What we think of is stuff like a browser, like you know, Chrome or Firefox or Safari or something like that. And the programs that we can, our systems that we can access through that. So most people think of web, internet, eh, all the same thing. It's not quite. Um, so the good side obviously is that we get an enormous amount of benefit out of the World Wide Web. Google search changed the way people think about information, mail systems, and so on, make, clearly provide a way of communicating for most people. Uh, news, as you can see, sort of mixed because now it's possible to get news from people who you agree with. And you don't have to listen to news that people you don't agree with but lots of other things as well. The bad side of this universal connectivity in particular, the reliance on the web, is that there's an enormous amount of tracking and monitoring and so on. So we're losing our privacy. There's a lot of bad stuff out there, people trying in some way to interfere with us. Um, they're also trying to interfere not just with us as individuals, but with also the companies that provide the services that we're using. And then, of course, in the background, there's always government agencies, and this is true in every country, that have some interest in um, seeing what's going on and perhaps modifying it. So I'm going to talk about four issues that I think are things we should be aware of and maybe think about doing something about. And maybe my kids, when they get 20 or 30 years from now and they're running the country, maybe they should be thinking about it too. Here are four. This is by no means a complete list of puzzles, but it's a, a few that I think are important. One is just our personal privacy and security. I think that is under continuous attack from all over the place. Um, an awful lot of the attack is purely commercial. It's just companies that want to know more about us so that they can do something uh, to their commercial advantage at some cost to our privacy and sometimes security. And there's just an enormous amount of that. Um, and that information that's collected about us is very often uh, escapes uh, under the influence of criminally um, uh, bad guys in some sense or another, where the companies that have collected information about us do a bad job of preserving it or protecting it. I've mentioned government uh, interference, and I think that's pervasive and getting worse as well as governments realize, gee, you know, you don't want people in your country to have too much freedom to do what they want or to get information that doesn't accord with the government. It varies from country to country, but uh, I think there's a clear trend there. Um, the bad guys are out there. There's always been bad guys, of course, since the beginning of time, but the bad guys are getting more and more sophisticated. And of course, the bad guys don't have to be in your own country. The bad guys can be anywhere and because the internet connects us all. And that means that, <laughs> that there's no way to bring them to justice uh, because they're not in your jurisdiction. Um, and then finally, I wanna talk a bit about the internet of things, which is basically devices that are connected to the internet that are not laptops and phones, but lots and lots and lots of other things. Um, those are increasingly common and they are from a security and privacy point of view, not nearly as well understood or as well controlled as our laptops and our phones. And so I think all, what Internet of Things is doing is in some ways exacerbating problems. So let's look at uh, these issues in a little more detail. Issue number one, um, Shoshana Zuboff is a professor in the Harvard Business School and uh, five or six, seven years ago, she coined this wonderful phrase called surveillance capitalism. And the idea is capitalism is based on watching us. So there are 
thousands at least, and maybe hundreds of thousands of companies that are collecting data about us at all times. Okay, they collect information about what we look at, what we do, where we go, what our phones are doing, what we buy, um, and they collect it, they aggregate it, they analyze it carefully, and then they sell it, primarily for targeted advertising, so that when you use your computer, you start to see advertisements, you know, oh, that's interesting, I was looking at shoes yesterday, and now I'm seeing advertisements for shoes today, uh, but it can also be used for lots of other things. Suppose that they know something about your race or ethnic background or whatever, then they can make sure that you see things that are relevant to that, or maybe you don't see things like rental, house rental or apartment rental, uh, because you're deemed to be in a group that they don't want to rent to. So lots of possibilities like that. The problem here is that the things that we use, what's called Google search, Facebook, social networking, LinkedIn for jobs, things like that, um, they're free, they're great services. Um, but the reason they're free is that we are paying for them indirectly by giving up information about ourselves that then gets used to target us for all kinds of things. And the real problem is it is not possible to be anonymous. You cannot be anonymous using your computer or your phone or a credit card, or if you appear in public because there's cameras everywhere. So these are all kind of potential problems. Um, let's take a quick look at how it works. There's an advertising marketplace. So suppose that you're sitting after our gathering is over and you go turn on Chrome or Firefox or Safari or whatever, and you ask for a particular web page. Let's suppose you go to the Wall Street Journal because you want to check the news, okay? And the web page publisher, let's call that the Wall Street Journal at the moment, but it could be the New York Times, or it could be Fox, or it could be ESPN or whatever, um, says, hey, we've got a person here. We're about to show that person a page. So we will notify an ad exchange that I've got space on a page. You want to show it to somebody? These ad exchanges are run by Google, which is the big dog here, but plenty of others as well. AppNexus is now owned by uh, AT&T, for example. And the publishers are things like the Wall Street Journal. And what the publisher does is it takes all this information that has been collected about you and says, okay, the person who's we're going to show this page to appears to be, I don't know, let's say he's a 65 year old guy, recently retired, he has a technical background, he owns a Lexus, he owns his own home, he lives in Maplewood, New Jersey, and he often commutes to Summit and, you know, lots and lots, oh, and he's Republican and he voted this way, but he's a liberal Republican and so he voted that. All these kinds of things put together and that is used to target you for the advertisement that you will see. So the advertisers, bid on that ad space using the ad exchange. So it's just running a real-time auction. And the winner of the auction gets to show you an advertisement. Oh, and that took a long time. It took probably 10 to 100 milliseconds total to put that advertisement in the page and that you see it. And you may get multiple advertisements on one page, okay? And this is all done because as you wander around the web, every web page you go to has tracking information embedded within it and that is accumulated, even though you go to lots of different places, it's accumulated and used to build this accurate picture of you, which is then augmented by things like your credit card history, your cell phone location, where they saw you on camera, and all kinds of other things. Let's make it concrete. Here's the Wall Street Journal. There's a wonderful site that you can visit that will tell you how are they watching you, okay? Well, I went to the Wall Street Journal. I just go to that page and it had 36 ad trackers, different companies that are tracking you when you go to the Wall Street Journal, okay? And they dropped 59 cookies, little bits of information so that the next time I go to anywhere, that cookie is said, oh, he was at the Wall Street Journal. No, he went to New York Times. Oh, he looked at Fox. Oh, he went to ESPN. And all of that information is there. Lots and lots and lots of different stuff. The Wall Street Journal is not an outlier here. That's more than the norm, but it's not an outlier. There are plenty that are worse. My wife goes to a cooking site, which is far worse than this for recipes. So anyway, um, <clears throat> it's a big business and <laughs> you are not the consumer. Uh, you're the data source on this kind of stuff. Okay, so that's issue one, commercial surveillance. How about issue two, government surveillance? Okay, so in 2013, Edward Snowden, who was a contractor at the National Security Agency, took a very large amount of internal documentation from NSA 
and released it to the public in a very controlled way um, that showed the extent, the stunning extent to which the National Security Agency and similar agencies in other countries were collecting information about their own citizens and about others and sharing it back and forth. Um, and uh, Snowden lives in Russia now and probably is going to come back from Russia. Um, but that information was quite surprising in the degree to which uh, information was collected about everybody. Among other things, National Security Agency monitored all phone calls in the United States, all emails, all text messages, and everything posted on social networks, uh, including either voluntary or coerced cooperation from the companies listed there, among others. And you've probably heard of at least a few of those companies. So this was an awful lot of that. Uh, state and local governments don't have quite the same resources, but they have a lot too. And so they have cameras all over the place. They have things that masquerade as cell phone towers that they can intercept, uh, cell communications. And of course they collect databases and exchange them with uh, state and federal law exchange as well. Some of these are of questionable legality. Are stingrays legal? Mm, unclear, but that doesn't seem to have slowed people down very much. Okay. One specific aspect I think is potentially scary. I mentioned cameras multiple times. If you walk around in the world, even wearing now a mask, which probably most of us are doing when we leave the house, um, Facial recognition has gotten to be more sophisticated in some ways. And so there's a better chance that you will be recognized by your face. And certainly that will be the case if you're coupling it with your cell phone, which knows exactly where you are at all time and is broadcasting that. Uh, but it turns out face recognition doesn't work perfectly and in particular doesn't work well on people of color. And so you get truly unfortunate things like this where some guy spent 10 days in jail and it cost him a fair amount of money to get himself cleared. Not everybody is that lucky. And therefore, this kind of thing, I think, is unfortunately um, a harbinger of the future in some ways as well. How about criminals? Lots of bad guys in the world. I think criminals are attacking us as individuals all the time. I'm sure you get phishing attacks quite regularly. I mean, I will guess that everybody here sometime in the last month has got one of these things where I'm, um, you know, my husband was a prince in Nigeria or some modern variation of that. Um, the same people are attacking companies where they can get information at wholesale rather than retail. Um, and they're attacking governments as well. And it's practically every day in the paper, you will see a story of some information that has been leaked from some company information about you and me or other aspects of their business. And this is the place where the bad guys are scattered all over the world because the internet is all over the world and they can be in some place like Eastern Europe and attack us just as comfortably as if they were in Summit. Um, and they're exploiting the vulnerabilities that we've seen in software and user errors. We do something foolish like, oh, that's a plausible site. Let me enter my password. Um, so all of those things are a problem. So this is criminal activity. And it turns out there's an interesting variation on this that we've seen just in the last few days. Uh, a lot of this stuff is actually run by governments. And the Russians seem to have done this extremely well. Okay, current US administration notwithstanding, the Russians actually did get a lot of an entree into a wide variety of fairly critical, uh, both government and commercial operations uh, over the last who knows how long, because nobody really knows the extent of all of this. And this is just one today fairly visible, but I'm sure not a unique version of this kind of thing. And then finally, the internet of things. Everything digital keeps getting smaller, faster, cheaper, better. And so you can embed things in small gadgets and devices and make them ubiquitous. Um, and then because part of the small, cheaper use, et cetera, is connectivity, network connectivity, you can make them connect to the internet. It doesn't cost anything extra, and so you can do it. And so what we have is not just computers and phones connected to the internet. We have all kinds of other things like your cameras, your toys, um, lots of things. Um, this is a Fitbit. I'm guessing that some of you have Fitbits. Google is trying very hard to buy Fitbit got approved in the EU last week or something like that. I'm not sure where it's been approved. Why does Google want a fitness tracker? Um, well, I could speculate. 
Um, and of course, Amazon, I think they stopped selling these little buttons where those were radio control buttons. And, you know, my wife ran out of paper towels. She could push the bounty button and next day, new package would arrive. Uh, it had a little hole so it could actually listen to conversation, oddly enough. Uh, here's a Nest thermostat sitting in somebody's living room or wherever. Uh, here's Alexa and Echo from Amazon, uh, listening to everything that's said in your house. Um, and so these things are everywhere. And the problem with the uh, internet of things type things is that uh, they are on average much more vulnerable than laptops and phones because they are not as sophisticated. Uh, they're, they're, they're earlier in their life cycle, if you like. Um, and the other thing is that there are no economic or social or legal incentives uh, for making them safe and secure. And furthermore, as a practical matter, it's sometimes very hard to upgrade them in the field. I mean, suppose that there's a bug in the button that pushes for bounty paper towels. Bah. Amazon's not going to fix that. There's no incentive to do it. And the other thing is that these are not passive devices. These are active uh, devices. In many cases, they have not just sensors that know what's going on, but they can do things. So um, if any of you have a Tesla and have tried self-driving cars, there's a big actuator there. <laughs> and so, it, you know, it can put on the brakes or turn the wheels or something like that. Uh, door locks, thermostats are obviously active. So all of those things are potentially risky in one way or another. And of course, they have the same kinds of vulnerabilities as any other system. And so here's Amazon Ring, which already has some serious privacy concerns associated with also had some flaky software in it, which made it possible for people to break in and attack people in their homes, not physically, but you know, uh, sending them images and sending them voice and things like that. So as you can see, there's a bunch of problems there. And uh, I think it's important that everybody understands it. So what should a well-informed person understand about this digital world that we're in? So what I've tried to do in the class, and I guess what I've done with perhaps too much rhetorical flourish today, is to talk about principles and mechanisms, and especially ones that are likely to endure. I mean, we're stuck with digital computers for a very long time. I mean, Al will tell you that quantum computing is just around the corner, maybe, but it's going to be digital computers for a while. And somebody else will tell biological, but it's going to be a while. Um, so understanding how computers work, specifically digital things, how software works and how it's hard to get it to work properly, understanding communications and the pervasiveness of all of these things, and then the convergence of all of those aspects together. I think understanding that is very important. Uh, another thing that I like, and it's probably just because I'm interested, but it's probably relevant too, is history. Thinking about where did things come from? How did people come up with these ideas? And what happened? Because sometimes what happened in the past is a plausible indicator of things that might happen in the future as well. So history is an important aspect of all of this. And then broadly, what I want kids in my class to do uh, is to sort of appreciate the trade-offs that are here. They, they may not think about the trade-offs, but there's a trade-off between a free service like Google Search and the giving up of some of your privacy for that. And how do you balance the two sides of that? It's not black and white, but there is a trade-off there. And if you think of it only as it's, oh, it's a wonderful service, uh, you have missed some of the trade-off that goes in that. that trade-off between privacy, convenience, and just free. Um, many of these systems, you can actually understand how they work. If you think about them, you know, what might the properties be? What must the properties be? And so you can start to think about technological systems and reason about what might work or might not work or might be uh, a bad idea of some of these things. And that's just that judgment about what makes sense. Could this make sense? If somebody says, oh, that's free, no problem. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? I'm not sure. So the bottom line, as I said earlier, is to try and give them a sort of an intelligent skepticism about technology. As I said, technology is a two-edged sword. Um, so try to, in some way, maximize the good stuff, minimize the bad stuff. Okay. So anyway, that is uh, all I wanted to say about that. I have. Uh, a slide. There's a variety of books on this. Bruce Schneier's uh, Data and Goliath is a very interesting book of five years ago, and he has a nice web page. Uh, there's um, various entities that are, have our interests in privacy and security 
at heart and <laughs> sorry about the advertising, but um, I wrote a book some years ago called Understanding the Digital World and there's a new version of it coming out in the fullness of time, should be out sometime in March or something like that, uh, second edition of it. So anyway, um, that is all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your attention. It's great fun to see so many uh, old friends and I hope, <laughs> I hope one of these days I'll see you in person. <laughs> Are we ready for questions and answers? I guess we are. Uh, I see hands raised. I'd like to. Um, I'd like to say, uh, you find the way of raising your hand uh, in, under the reactions icon. If you have a screen, uh, if you're using an iPhone, it might be under the more, uh, the word more, you touch that. Uh, I see some hands raised and please, because time is very short, uh, ask one simple question and then we'll have the answer and we'll move on. Uh, so uh, we'll give Bill Tittle the honor of the, being the first to ask a question. Go ahead, Bill. Thank you very much, Brian. Terrific presentation, thank you. So here's my question to you. Um, I want to have a way to partially opt out of data. I'm, I wanna negotiate my trade-off of it's free, but uh, you want my data. I want it to be a legal document. Is that just stupid? Does it have some promise? Is anybody working on this? I think um, at the moment, it's probably wishful thinking. It might happen. There are instances of places where that kind of, I want to opt out, I want to have control, have had some effect. So for example, in the European Union, there's something called the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, um, which basically says that companies are not allowed to collect information about you unless you explicitly give them permission. It's not one of these, oh, you opted in because you clicked a button kind of thing. Um, that was put into effect in 2018, and I don't know for sure. I think it has had an effect. And if you visit uh, European websites, uh, you will see GDPR type notices at the bottom. The, cl the closest that you will see in the United States is if you are in California, there is something called the CCPA, California Consumer Protection Act or something like that, which went into effect mm, beginning of 2020 maybe. Uh, I don't remember for sure, that has the same spirit as the, uh, as the GDPR. With luck, California often sets the style or, or direction for many consumer protection kinds of things in the country. Um, and so maybe that will have some effect as well. Uh, if I can share the screen again, I have one more slide that might actually also give you not a legal way to deal with this, because I think you're cooked on that, but a way to uh, at least reduce your capture cross section or whatever you might want to call it. Uh, let me put it here, see if this works. And uh, click there. Um, this was sort of a uh, self-defense. So while you wait for the legal system to catch up, uh, <laughs> which may take a while, um, these are things that you can do so that you can probably cut your exposure down by a factor of easily 10 and maybe 100 uh, just by better behavior. I mean, it's like washing your hands or something like that. If you do some of these things, uh, you will be less visible uh, and and it's not like you have to do it perfectly. You just have to outrun your neighbor or something like that. And so turning off uh, trackers is a big step in that. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, using systems whose goal is not explicitly tracking you. In other words, don't use Google, don't use Facebook, stay the heck away from them. Um, and add things to your browser, these extensions that basically block trackers. So the Wall Street Journal I showed you had, you know, whatever it was, 36 trackers and 59 cookies. If I go to the Wall Street Journal, I get exactly zero of those because I have blockers. 
And so uh, you can do the same sort of things. Long answer to a short and well-posed question. Thank you. I'll Thank stop. Thank you. Uh, Mitch Erickson. Yeah. Hi, Brian. Um, you mentioned that we're 40 years into the personal computing, and most of us actually remember the old IBM PC that you showed a picture of. Um, today, as we saw with the, the Zoom at the beginning, um, this me re remains a tool that we fight with more than just kind of use. We use a refrigerator, we use our TV, and we continue to have problems working our computers. Um, the question is, do you see a light at the end of that tunnel? Well, I, I, I share that, that fight with them um, image. It's a very accurate picture of what seems to happen, at least uh, in my world. Uh, and I think, Again, it's probably one of these things that's a trade-off. If you take a device like an iPad, and I know some of you are using iPad, that's a device which tries to remove a lot of the you know, options and bells and whistles and methods of control that you might have with a real computer. Um, and so in some ways it's a lot easier to use. And the downside is then that it's always preventing you from doing something that you want to do because you can't figure out how to do it. I mean, I have two iPads and I hate them with a passion because I can't figure out how to make them do anything useful. Um, and so I think, unfortunately, the trend is increasingly going to be to make the devices that we have less and less controllable by us ordinary users. But I'm guessing a lot of folks here are fairly technical order um, ordinary users. And so they would probably feel that frustration of, I know I should be able to control it. I should be able to do something and it won't let me do it. Um, I think that sadly we are going to be in a decreasing minority at, and, and systems will be more and more locked down and it would be harder and harder uh, to actually control them and do what we want, even if we know what we're doing. And that's quite apart from the, it's hard to control them when you don't know what's going on and you just you know, it isn't working and I don't know why and I don't know what to do about it. I'm pessimistic, sorry. Thank you. Uh, John Tomaszewski. Yeah, hi, Brian, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm just wondering, I, that Wall Street Journal page where you showed how many uh, people were looking in on it, is, was that a website or an app or how, how can we get a hold of that? It's a website, give me 30 seconds here. Uh, and I will, uh, it is called themarkup.org. Actually, I could probably put this in the chat, couldn't I? That'd be a good idea. Let me see if I can do that. And we go, here's the chat and we go bzzzt, and it should do it. Yeah, this is a, a really interesting site. Um, I, it's basically somebody took a browser, stripped away the user interface part and just made it something that would go and sort of say, okay, I'll take anything you send me and then uh, accumulated it and so on. And um, it appeared at least on my radar, maybe three, four months ago at most. And I, <laughs> I find it enlightening. Um, and I, as I say, the Wall Street Journal is by no means the worst offender, although it was somewhat worse than the New York Times when I tried it. And um, uh, the cooking site I mentioned is epicurious.com, which my wife likes, and it's just appalling what they do. Um, so anyway, your mileage may vary, but, <laughs> but I, I found it a neat site. Uh, next question from Haas. Uh, one short question, don't forget. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Cunningham. It's a Great refresher course for all the information, the bits of information I had. Uh, one other question, probably, you know, it's a moot point at this point in time. You know, it has always been uh, bothering me why the Bell Labs missed the opportunity to productize, capitalize on all these great technologies, inventions, basic and applied research, so on and so forth. Uh, a lot of companies took advantage of that, a lot of uh, alumni from uh, the labs, built up great organizations. Is it because it was driven by the pure uh, scientists and technologies, not businessmen? Of course. Uh, hello? Yeah. 
Okay, uh, so I honestly don't know for sure, and uh, there are people uh, in, on this call who are closer to Bell Labs um, organizationally and physically today than I am, um, but I think part of the issue was that, that AT&T was a very large company and was, um, you know, had a huge embedded base as it were, and it was just hard to change uh, in any way, really, uh, a tradition and a very valuable tradition that had been established over, call it uh, close to 100 years of providing universal telephone service, uh, but at the price of not having very much competition. And so when competition started to appear because of regulatory pressures, among others, uh, it became um, hard for high level management, perhaps at at and to uh, react sufficiently quickly. I guess the other thing, uh, it, it, there was always a sort of tension between research parts of Bell Labs and development parts because each had their own pressures. Research were going, oh, wow, we could do this really neat thing. And so on and development folks were saying, yeah, but geez, you got to build the thing and you got to put it in the field and you got to maintain it for eons. And, and it doesn't really quite solve the problems we have anyway. And so I found that I think there was a fair amount of that um, as well. So. I think there are places where AT&T probably dropped the ball on things. There are other places where they were just a little too early and somebody didn't quite see it uh, at the right time. I, I guess cell phone technology is kind of the obvious one. I wish I knew the real story on that. But the, the story I hear is the McKinsey survey that said, oh, there'd be never a market for portable telephones. Um, <laughs> that was kind of a misjudgment. Um, on the other hand, the picture phone stuff was, you know, eons ahead of time. Uh, and at the time, gee, who would have imagined people would want, and nobody did want their pictures uh, to be associated with their phone calls and look at us today. <laughs> so, um, so things change around the environment as well. So the short answer is, I don't know. Um, and I suspect that there are good books on the general, uh, you know, why any given organization didn't do the proper thing. Another company that had that same kind of problem was Xerox. And there have been several uh, reprises of how Xerox uh, Research Center, the Palo Alto Research Center, invented all kinds of really, really fundamental things. And Xerox, the company, did not capitalize on those either. So details probably vary, but some things are probably uh, <laughs> universal problems of big organizations. Uh Paul, did you have a question? Well, I, I did. Uh, OK, uh, Ed Atkin, uh, please ask your question, Ed. Hey, I'll, I'll make it short. Did you do it? I worked at Fort Monmouth. Did you do any work with Fort Monmouth in the military with computers? No, I did not. I never had anything uh, to do with that at all. I, I worked occasionally with people at Homedale and Crawford Hill, but that's as close as I got to the coast. But nothing with the military you worked with in your... Um, not really. There was a lot of interest when the safeguard systems were uh, active and the Whippany lab, was it Whippany? No, uh, closer than that. I'm blocking on the actual name, but... Um, and there were people who went from research like Vic Vysotsky uh, who worked in various parts of the military system, but I had no particular connection with those. Okay, thanks, uh, very informative talk. Uh, Dick Aiken. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Brian, for covering four issues uh, of uh, the uh, network, but I was wondering if you had thoughts of another issue namely social networks. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation being around. Uh, we, we're getting a polarized society. Uh, the, the, the political system is, is really uh, in bad shape. And in fact, I think social media can be a, a true th uh, threat to our democracy. And I was hoping that you would have some comments on social media. Please. Yeah, I, 
I think you've summarized it, unfortunately, all too accurately. Um, I think social media, and let me say Facebook as the single biggest example of it, are proving to be disastrous for all kinds of things there. Uh, rather than bringing people together, they're uh, enabling you know, fragmented populations. Uh, they're enabling news that is just flat wrong, uh, the best you could say about it. Um, and. And perhaps the worst thing is that that a lot of people are enabling this by volunteering all their information. You know, they post everything in their lives on Facebook so that Facebook has more information from which they can, whether consciously or not, uh, divide the population further and encourage uh, people who shouldn't actually be allowed anywhere near uh, a public computer. So I, I, you know, I say friends don't like friends use Facebook. I've never used Facebook um, and I don't plan to. Um, I think that it's probably the worst because it's the most visible and the most influential, but there are plenty of others and I don't use them either. So I, I guess in some sense, I'm casting stones on them without actually using them, but, I, but I'm right. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to cut in to mention that it's now 1140 and uh, Brian is uh, still seems enthusiastic. So we're still going to ask him a few more questions. But uh, for those of you who have time pressures, take note of it. And we may not get to all the questions. Uh, the Brian, next Brian, one... Tell us when you need to stop, Brian. Yeah, I have a student uh, showing up shortly before noon and showing up, uh, you know what I mean. Uh, <laughs> okay, how about uh, five more minutes maximum? So we'll take one more question, uh, Steve Varley. Uh, Professor Kernigan, first, uh, thank you for a professional and yet highly entertaining presentation. You referred to the imperfections of facial recognition software, particularly when it comes to people of color. Uh, and, and that is certainly true. How should we evaluate it though, given that the alternative eyewitness testimony and recognition is probably even more flawed? Yeah, that's a, that's a very perceptive question. I think the difference might be that face recognition technology is done at scale. And so there's just all kinds of people who are influenced by it, uh, whether they know about it or not. Whereas if you get to the point of being in a court setting where somebody is you know, claiming that they saw you do something <laughs> bad, uh, that's kind of more like one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and so you don't have this dragnet uh, effect that you get with uh, you know, scanning every face that walks into uh, a store or the like. I think arguably it could be more accurate in terms of identifying a specific person, but the case that I mentioned, which I haven't read very carefully, um, it seems like they just found a, a guy who was black and gee, well, he looked like some other guy who was black who had uh, a record and therefore that was the same person. Uh, whereas in fact, they didn't look particularly alike anyway, but the program thought they were. And then you have this automatic mechanism that's going after um, and chasing people down without giving them enough recourse. Um, so I, Face recognition as a technology will probably get better over the next, pick a time period, five or 10 years to the point where it may well be more reliable. Um, and therefore the uh, conclusions that you might draw from it could be more uh, you know, persuasive in a court of law or something like that. But I think you still have to be very, very careful about how it's used um, or you're going to create more problems than you solve in some sense. Uh this was wonderful. Um, and I'm very sorry to say that I'm going to have to cut off the questions. Uh, now it's time for Al Aho to continue. Uh, Al, uh, did, I, did I get you there? Yes, you're unmuted. Go ahead, Al. Brian, thank you very much for a superb talk. It had the three qualities the old guard treasures and talks. It was educational, it was eloquent, and it was entertaining. Uh, we have two ways of thanking our speakers. One is to give them a certificate of appreciation. And the nice part about it is that it has a picture of an orchid 
which reflects the very early beginnings of the Summit Old Guard. We've been in business since 1930. And at that time, Summit was the orchid capital of the East. So uh, we'll send you a physical copy of this as soon as we can, but at least you can have this um, virtual copy um, and add to your, I don't know whether you have any more room in your office wall for other tokens of appreciation. And the um, second way we have of thanking our uh, speakers is the old guard salute. So let's give Brian an old guard salute. Thank you again, Brian, for just I think wrote, I should say warning us what every well informed person wrote about. know about computers. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Brian. You know, there's a lot of the people on members here. Just want as as uh, just to close this up, uh, we started uh, 2021 with a great, great presentation, and we've got, I think. Uh, 51, no, 50 more. We, we skip one week. So we have 50 more this year. So Brian, uh, you've set the bar very high. Thank you very much.